So, um, hello everyone. Um, I'm Vitaly. I work for Red Hat, and I'm going to talk about uh, CPU vulnerabilities and public clouds today. So, uh, I usually work uh, on a Linux kernel, uh, enabling Linux on like third-party hypervisors and public clouds, and I'm also a KVM reviewer in my spare time. One of the KVM reviewers. So. Uh, as you know, there are like a couple vulnerabilities uh, discovered in the last like two years, and you've probably heard about all of them. They have some, something in common. They are like speculative uh, execution, like side channel attacks, which um, allow an attacker to gain some information by analyzing the microarchitectural, the lower state of the CPU. Uh, and uh, this is something new. And uh, the question is, like, uh, if you're running your own uh, architecture, you should be aware of them. You should go read and uh, see how you need to mitigate. There is no way around that. But what if you are running your workload on a public cloud, right? When there is a new vulnerability, you probably, uh, you know, open up some website on day one and you read, oh, there is a new scary vulnerability, but then there is a link to my cloud provider's blog post which tells me, we took care of everything, we knew about it for the last like three months, we updated our fleet, it's all good. So is this so or is there is something you still need to be aware of? The answer depends. So let's take a look at the possible like attack scenarios. So one VM, like when we are talking about public cloud, they're running VMs. They call them instances, they call them uh, some other types, but uh, the question is like, there are three, four types of attacks, like major. Like one VM can attack another VM, the VM can attack hypervisor, and there are two other types, like uh, you can do mount attacks inside the VM, right? So uh, some user space application can attack kernel, or some user space application can attack another user space application. So uh, your cloud provider will most likely uh, take care of the first two because they're not crazy, right? They can get sued for that. And, uh, but what about the other two? And the answer is, it, again, it depends. But because they think, or the cloud providers think of that it's a little bit outside of their domain of responsibility, right? They don't guarantee you anything because there are multiple types of attacks which can be mounted uh, inside the VM. But uh, they still sometimes need to provide you some tools so you can actually mitigate some of these vulnerabilities in your VMs. So um, uh, the question is like, when do you need these tools? And uh, it very much depends on what's happening inside your VM. And uh, you have to answer the questions like, if it's like a single tenant or a multi-tenant VM. If it's like a single task VM, VM which basically runs one application, or you have like multiple applications running there. Uh, are you relying on like a language-based security? So is there like a JIT environment there? And uh, uh, is actually hyper-threading important for you? So uh, I will go through uh, the vulnerabilities. I won't go into details because uh, there are too many of them and I don't have that much time. But I will give you like a brief overview of them. And if you need some hardware features, do they need to get passed through to the VM or not? So uh, let's start with Spectre V1 because it's V1. And uh, the attack is basically a buffer overflow without buffer overflow. If you have a user control offset, you can mount this attack when switching between different contexts. If uh, you, do, you want to learn more, you can go, for example, to Intel website where there's a deep dive about it. And uh, the way how we mitigate it is pure in software. So the cloud provider will likely fix the hypervisor. And there is no like microcode or any other update required. So there is nothing which needs to be passed through to your VM. But you still need to uh, have the mitigation because they happen on a case by case basis, right? So whenever there is a, a gadget in your kernel, it needs to get fixed. So you just need to keep your kernel updated basically and you're gonna be fine with this particular attack. There is a modification of it uh, which is called like swap GS, but it's not the same, but the same in a way that uh, we get outside of the allowed range when we access data. And uh, uh, again, it's uh, mitigated in software for the existing CPUs which are vulnerable, and there's gonna be 
new CPUs which won't have the vulnerability and you will have see this flag in your VM which will make it a little bit faster but it's all mitigated in software just keep your kernel updated uh, Spectre v2 is an interesting one actually uh, it's uh, a vulnerability when we use a branch predictor and we train it in one context and then uh, it's been like misused or it mis mispredicts targets in another context and uh, to mitigate this particular vulnerability you actually need both like software and uh, hardware features and uh, hardware features I won't go through all of them but basically they either stop the speculation between uh, different contexts like uh, different uh, privilege levels or they provide a barrier and in software we do uh, a technique called Redpaline uh, invented by Google and it's a clever way to uh, prevent uh, speculation purely in software so uh, uh, thinking about attacking like between VMs and VMs to hypervisors for uh, attacks between VMs it's not possible if you are not sharing cores and actually for almost all bigger instance types of, of on cloud providers there is no core sharing there you get cores to your like exclusive usage you can uh, still attack the hypervisor but your cloud provider will likely take care of it by utilizing one of these techniques either like rebuild this hypervisor with red pauline or using these uh, hardware features but what about the NVM attacks uh, yeah I'm also showing uh, how you can check what's going on inside your VM there is an interface in sys which kernel will tell you what's going on for all of them so uh, for enhanced to bearers is something which will be in I think Cascade Lake uh, and uh, then it will be to a certain extent mitigated in hardware but to a certain extent means that there is going to be no speculation between different privilege levels on the same privilege levels for example one user space attacking another one you still need a bearer and for that your cloud provider needs to provide you this hardware feature if it's not provided to you, you it's nothing you can do about it only I mean if there is user space which you can like rebuild with red polins or something then you can mitigate if you have some legacy workload there is basically nothing you can do there and uh, uh, also as it's like cross uh, hyper thread so the branch predictor can be shared across cores it may happen that uh, one thing happening on one thread is attacking another thing happening on another thread and uh, for that there is no good protection you may actually want to go to uh, disabling SMT is it can actually be faster than some of the Intel CPU features which are being designed to uh, protect you against these vulnerabilities uh, going forward um, uh, meltdown meltdown is an Intel specific vulnerability uh, which uh, uh, it's about page tables when uh, your page tables are shared between your user space and kernel and we are uh, speculatively reading some memory which doesn't belong to user space and uh, we currently uh, uh, I mean again there is no uh, hardware support required for mitigation uh, for uh, to mitigate between like VMs and VMs and hypervisors there is uh, nothing needed because uh, usually they don't share page tables it was only Zen PV which was still used in very very old AWS instances when they had to play some trick and they actually put Zen PV in an HVM container to mitigate this initially uh, inside uh, VM uh, you also need like an updated kernel but it's already like two years old right so everything after 2018 should be protected the technique is called page tab table isolation so you have different page tables between user space and kernel and eventually when this is fixed in hardware you won't need it it will run slightly faster uh, speculative store bypass uh, an interesting one basically to mount the attack you are writing to memory and reading from the same address from memory and uh, in some cases your read can happen actually before your write finishes and uh, usually it doesn't really matter because you have control over this memory but in some contexts it actually does so you are reading the stale value and uh, to actually mitigate this vulnerability you need a hardware feature called speculative store bypass disable or word on AMD there is a different one and uh, again uh, 
it doesn't seem that we are able to use this vulnerability to attack like other VMs or the hypervisor. And uh, it seems that this environment which is at risk is the jitted environment, where we can actually write the speculative gadget we need, because it provides us an easy way to you know, do them. And um, by default, if you have this CPU feature in your VM or like on hardware after a microcode update, it's only enabled for uh, PRCTL and SecCom processes because it again slows you down, right? And uh, uh, mostly you need it if you are running an untrusted jitted code in your VM, like Java VS. Uh, L1 terminal fault, again uh, related to page tables that when we, there is a page table which is like not present, for example, or reserved, then uh, usually you don't have access there, but uh, speculatively your CPU can actually access to some memory location which is under the attacker's control. And um, there is a feature, again, with, which comes to you, to you with microcode update, but um, basically you only need it if you are running your own hypervisor on bare metal, because even if you are running like a nested hypervisor on public clouds, and not many public clouds allow you to do that, but for example, Azure does, uh, you don't really need it because they, mo they most likely take care of this when switching between like VM and hypervisor in, uh, soft, uh, in, on the hypervisor they use this feature. Uh, there is an interesting implication of this one that uh, L1 cache is actually shared again on, it's actually the one uh, L1 cache for the whole core. So all hyper threads are using it. And the question is like, what for example happens when one of your hyper thread exits to the hypervisor and the other still has like user space task running, right? So there were some uh, techniques suggested like kick it out of the execution to the hypervisor to block the vCPU. So um, we don't know for sure to which extent these techniques are being used on hypervisors and cloud providers. Hopefully they do something. We cannot really check. Uh, but uh, again, um, uh, to mitigate against the attack inside the VM, uh, we use a software-based technique which is called PT inversion. We basically write some address which cannot be normally used to access any data to PTs which are not uh, which are not present or reserved. And uh, again, this L1 there is a parameter to a kernel which you can switch the mitigation, but you don't really need it unless you are running like bare metal uh, hypervisor on bare metal. Uh, the PT inversion, the software-based technique, which comes to you with an updated kernel, is like good enough. Uh, MDS, interesting one. Uh, there are some smaller structures in the CPU which you don't cannot access with any instructions. But uh, that after doing some execution in the CPU, there can be some leftovers in the structures. And with some techniques, there are like many of them and new types of attacks are being discovered in this space, uh, you can actually get some like bits from there. Uh, it's not that you're getting like access to uh, some, I know, uh, full user pages or anything because these uh, structures are really, really, really small. But you can still get some bits, for example, and if there is like uh, some interesting like security related computation has been done on another uh, hyper thread. It's kind of risky. And uh, again, new CPUs are supposed to get fixed. And uh, you cannot attack another core or another VM. And, um, but you can attack the hypervisor when an exit is being done there. So your cloud provider most likely will take care of it by updating the hypercode and using and clearing all these buffers when it switches to your VM and back. Uh, again, the same thing as with uh, L1 terminal fault is that when one hyper thread exits 
to the hypervisor what happens on the other one, right? Because they can they are sharing the structure. The hyper threads are not real cores, right? And uh, again, uh, like core scheduling uh, was suggested that uh, only one VM belonging to only one tenant has been scheduled on the core at the same time. And if it exits to, for example, interrupt, then uh, we may want to block another core. Cloud providers most likely do something about this. So the question is, um, what do you do in, uh, in software on your VM? And I'm actually grouping these like uh, transaction as the TSX async abort here, because basically it's another way to mount the attack, but you're attacking the same uh, structures. And uh, it was uh, mitigated in a weird way by Intel, at least, uh, that an existing instruction was repurposed to clean the buffers. So uh, there is a feature flag called MD clear. You can see it in your like CPU flags if it's present there or not. It will tell you when it's present. You know that uh, buffers are being cleaned when the instruction is executed, and your kernel actually does that. But if it's not present, you cannot really tell for sure, because it may be the case that your cloud provider actually updated microcode, but just didn't expose this uh, feature to you. And you can still use the mitigation by issuing the instruction on the CPU. And that's what actually what Linux does. Uh, it still tries. It tells you, like, well, the state is unknown, yeah, but I will still try to issue the instruction just in case. Uh, it prevents, like, uh, uh, user space against like kernel attacks, but if again, if you are having two user space tasks of like different tenants running on the same core, different hyper threads at the same time, you are still vulner vulnerable because there is no good place to you know put the flush, right? So you cannot flush after every instruction. You can only flush, for example, when you enter kernel and leave kernel. But if they are running simultaneously, it can still gain some data from another thread. And uh, in that case, if you are really worried about such types of attacks, you can either like isolate your cores and put tasks like manually pin your tasks to different physical cores, assuming that you actually trust your cloud provider to give you genuine SMT topology, which they actually do, because it's like in their interest to expose, you know, trustworthy topology to you. Or you can just disable SMT completely, and uh, it depends, right, to which extent you care about uh, such attacks. Uh, just for uh, the sake of completeness, there was some other vulnerability discovered uh, early, um, in the fall of 19, yeah, it's like several months ago, and called like ITLB multi-hit, and uh, it's not a speculative execution uh, attack. It's uh, actually a way to mount a DOS attack on your physical CPU when you create uh, two different page size structures and don't flush your TLB buffer in between. Your CPU may actually encounter an error just stop, like physical CPU. But uh, for sure your cloud provider took care of this one. You can actually try, right, execute, you know, <laughs> the exploit and your cloud provider either took care of it or he won't let you do anything ever again. But <laughs> up to you. Uh, so, um, uh, no, it's been mitigated in software on if you are interested how it's been done on the hypervisor. So we are either forbidding different pages page sizes or like mounting, uh, just mapping them as like non-executable pages. So whenever an execution happens, we actually like split them. That's what we, for example, do in uh, KVM. So uh, now I just wanted to show you some uh, examples of some like existing instance types on, on different cloud providers. Uh, and let's start with AWS. So. Here is like R5N large instance, and if you go to like this sys interface and see what's happening, you will see something like that. How do you read it? So the first one is kind of irrelevant because uh, there is no VMX exposed to you, so you don't really care about ITLB. This uh, different page sizes, the hypervisor takes care of it, and it's just irrelevant 
to you. L1TF, as I told you, has been mitigated in software with UPTA inversion. So you can see it here. MDS, the feature wasn't exposed to us. We don't see MD clear. So we still try to do uh, the buffer flushing, but we're not sure. Most likely it is mitigated. Uh, meltdown, again, software-based mitigation, base table isolation, very likely secure. Uh, speculative store bypass. We don't get the feature, didn't get the feature, so it's nothing we can do. So in case we are running this untrusted, jitted code, then we may be in trouble. Again, you can try to mitigate by putting it like on different cores because it's an attack against uh, level one uh, cache. Uh, Spectre V1, uh, again, software-based mitigation in the kernel. We are good. Spectre V2, not really. Uh, we didn't get this uh, STABP and IBPB features. So uh, if we care about one user space attacking another user space, you cannot attack your kernel because it's user at Palins. But you can attack user space which doesn't user at Palins from another user space. Then again, uh, what you can do is you can pin them to different cores or you can just avoid running this like multi-tenant and secure workloads in one instance. There is no hardware features provided to you. Azure. F8S V2. I just I was just picking some random uh, instances. These two are I think Skylakes, so uh, no particular thought was put into picking one of another instance type. And I cannot show you all of them. There are way too many. But uh, it's very very close to what I just showed you were AWS. The only difference is that they actually expose uh, VMX capabilities to you. So you can actually run nested uh, hypervisor there. Though you don't need all these mitigations, which you can still use, but we have no uh, smart logic, for example, in kernel to not use them when we are running nested. And again, the same story. Uh, those which are mitigated in software are mitigated because I'm running a recent enough kernel. It was 5.5 RC something kernel, like a couple of weeks ago. And uh, for... MDS and uh, TAA, we don't know. The flag wasn't exposed to us. We still try with this instruction. Uh, for Spectre V2, it's the same story that no hardware features, so we cannot share different user space tasks which don't trust each other on the same core. The last one I want to show you is uh, from Google Cloud Engine. And uh, it's a Cascade Lake, so or like in your CPU, and there are some noticeable differences here. For example, uh, for uh, SSBD and uh, Spectre V2, features were exposed to us. So our kernel actually is using them. And uh, this actually is the reason why the cloud providers may not want to expose these features, because as soon as they do, your kernel will automatically start using them. Oh, I have features for hardware mitigation. I need to use them. And this kills the performance. So there are some legacy performance which, and it, it's not like a couple percent. It can be like, you know, like 50% or 60% performance hit, depending on what you do. But uh, for example, like STIBP, which was like mentioned on here, which is like, Disabled, it's not the great way how these features are presented here. I was actually sending an RFC to uh, print STIBP like not available, that you don't have support in hardware because here it says it's disabled. You don't know if it's disabled by the kernel, by you, or there is no hardware support for that. So here it's like a newer CPU, so no red is needed. So you can see that enhanced IBRS has been used instead. And, uh, but they actually pass through all these features. They don't probably care that much about the performance of legacy workloads, but they do care more about giving you like, all those features to do mitigations. And uh, that's it from me. Uh, yeah, uh, we don't really have time for questions, as I predicted, but I already answered some <laughs> before my talk. So uh, if you have any questions, just catch me somewhere in the corridor, and I'll be 
happy to chat. So thank you.